local anesthetic systemic toxicity, how it came into our vocabularies, how to use it in resuscitation, and where it's going in our future. So we have to talk about local anesthetic toxicity by beginning to think about when bupivacaine was synthesized, and that happened in 1957. 1963, we saw its first use in clinical practice, and by 1970, there were already case reports of cardiac arrhythmias. 1977, there was toxicity with peripheral nerve blocks, and by 1983, or 20 years after it became part of our clinical use, it was uh, banned from being used in obstetric anesthesia. And then nothing really happened in the story of bupivacaine or local anesthetic toxicity for another 15 years until this gentleman. And this is Guy Weinberg, who was doing some serendipitous findings while researching carotene deficiency. And he noted in his studies that when you gave lipid emulsions to a rat, the, e, uh, the lethal dose of bupivacaine was exponentially increased. And conversely, when you used it for resuscitation, the resuscitation proved much more effective. And he had a little bit of a trouble because nobody was really standing in line to test his hypothesis. Nobody wanted to have a cardiac arrest stimulated on them to see if bupivacaine would be reversed with lipid. So he did the next best thing. And in 2003, he did a study using larger animals. And this was a really pivotal study, I think, for all of us who practice regional anesthesia. He took 20 dogs, gave them general anesthesia, and induced a bupivacaine cardiac arrest. He gave 10 minutes of internal cardiac massage, and then he randomized these uh, animals to either receive lipid or saline in their resuscitation. And what he found is that the dogs that had lipid as part of the resuscitation had 100% survival, and the salines had no survival at all. And it was around that time at regional meetings, we all started talking, are you going to put lipid in your block carts? Do you have it? Should we do it? Nobody really knew. But this was about 2003. So before I move forward, let me remind you that a lipid effusions are emulsions in water of soybean and egg yolk phospholipid, and they make tiny little particles, which basically you're making a salad dressing in your blood. You're making a lipid layer that's separating from the aqueous phase. And the theory of how it works is that this is a lipid sink, that that lipid bilayer sequesters toxins of high lipid lipophilicity, like local anesthetics and other things, as we'll see. And in fact, bupivacaine preferentially goes into that layer over an aqueous phase at a ratio of more than 11 to 1. There may be a secondary metabolic benefit from the lipid as well, as it can be a substrate for cardiac muscles. Well, another study that nobody's standing in line for is how much lipid can you give a human being before something bad happens. And the next best thing we could look at is this study by Hiller, who looked at the uh, lethal dose of rats of lipid using a Dixon up and down method. And he sacrificed the animals, looked at their uh, organ damage, and looked at the neurologic, cardiac symptomatology that they had with increasing doses. And really, except for transient elevations in serum lipids, up to these doses, very little was seen in these rats. And he calculated that the LD50 in rats is about 67 plus or minus 10, which is way in excess of any dosage that we're going to talk about using in human beings. So this study supports the safety of lipid infusions at current doses. They're not totally benign. There are reactions. They're great contaminants. Things love to grow in lipid. You can have direct pyogenic uh, reactions with nausea and vomiting, chills and fevers. You can get thrombophlebitis. Patients can have allergies to um, components of the soybean oil. I looked in the uh, literature, and the only patients that I've seen that have actually had pancreatitis are these three cases of patients that have had underlying GI problems. And in terms of worrying about pulmonary complications in humans, I have not seen any in any patients with normal lungs. And in patients that do have ARDS, there may be some enhanced inflammation, but it's always been transient. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you my story, because this really, I need you to know, is not my patient. It was a colleague's. But it was a patient with a uh, cardiac uh, conduction disturbance and a long la laundry list of cardiac issues. But he had intractable shoulder pain, this was considered peripheral surgery, and the surgeon, the patient, and the anesthesiologist decided that it was well within the risk to do a, a regional block for his arthroscopy. It was a long time ago. It was a stimulation technique. 
The agents were pretty reasonable, and 30 seconds after the block completed, the patient had a tonic-clonic seizure, which was stopped with propofol, not because of its lipid content, it won't help, but because that was what was there, and 90 seconds later, we saw a full-blown cardiac arrest. Patient, people were doing CPR, we were called uh, cardiac to put the patient on bypass, patient intubated, CPR, and then lipid was given. And with this simple bolus of 100 cc's, which is almost the correct dose, the 70 kilogram patient should get one and a half milligrams per kilogram, but it was good enough, we saw sinus rhythm, and the patient woke up with a block and no neurologic sequela. And as Dr. Perlis mentioned, we reported this. Within the next couple of months in the literature, we saw two more reports of successful resuscitations up from ropivacaine and levobupivacaine. But then, not a heck of a lot of stuff happened in our story until May of 2008, when anesthesia and analgesia slapped a bottle of 20% lipid on an ambulance and presented four more cases for our consideration. The first one described the successful use of lipid in resuscitating a child. The second one showed that lipid could be used along that seizure and uh, last spectrum. This patient was an older gentleman who had neurologic changes and a couple of stray cardiac beats, and the lipid was given, and there was a return of sinus rhythm, but also normalcy of his mental status. The third case was interesting in that they never gave a lipid bolus. They only started an infusion, and the resuscitation took a very long time, although it was eventually successful. But it reminds us that you need that bolus. You need to create that lipid layer for your lipophilic agents to um, enter. And the last case came from the Mayo Clinic, and I like that because the residents involved in this case had just gone through simulation of a rare event which happened to have been last, and two days later, within 10 minutes, they were able to put this protocol together and get a, a palpating a rhythm on this patient that had a local anesthetic systemic toxicity and cardiac arrest. Well, around the same time that we started presenting these cases for your consideration, our emergency room colleagues and other physicians had been looking at our case reports as well. For verapamil toxicity, for clomipirine, for organophosphate, for propranolol-induced uh, hypotension, and more uses for antidepressants. So for other very lipophilic agents, this uh, lipid infusion rescue seems to be useful. So now the question is, we know it works. How should we incorporate lipid into a successful resuscitation of our patients. And we're gonna go back to some rat studies and then we'll talk about why rat studies are rats and not people. Uh, but Guy Weinberg, again, our, our guru, took our rats, put them to sleep under general anesthesia, caused a bupivacaine cardiac arrest, and then decided to resuscitate them after giving them oxygen and CPR with either a 30% lipid infusion, saline, or a high dose epinephrine infusion. And he looked at ECG, arterial pressure, and uh, mixed venous oxygen. And in situation after situation, watching these resuscitations, at the 10 minute time, we see that the group that was resuscitated with lipid has um, a lower blood lactate level than the ones with the epinephrine, has a higher pH and higher mixed venous oxygens. So it looks like lipid not only resuscitates, but resuscitates probably or possibly better than high dose epinephrine. In fact, all the metrics improve more with lipid, and 80% of the rats that got um, epinephrine not only had pulmonary edema, but all of them had ectopy. And the theory is that epinephrine might worsen tissue perfusion, make cardiac output less effective, and really the quality of the recovery of epinephrine is no better and may be even worse than control studies. Well, when you look at the cover of anesthesiology and you see something that looks like this, you look at the picture, you see this is a recurring theme. Again, we have our rat hearts, bupivacaine toxicity, resuscitation with lipid only, low dose epi, and high dose epi. And here we see high dose epi just isn't going to cut it. And Hiller showed us this in his group of rats, again, with bupivacaine induced <laughs> cardiac arrests. And they were treated with lipid and epinephrine in varying doses from 1 to 25 mics of epi. And what we see is that the Rats that received epinephrine had a quicker recovery, but this recovery was unable to be sustained. And that if you waited a couple more minutes to get a lipid or a low dose lipid uh, with low dose epinephrine recovery, it was definitely sustainable. 
Again, you are asking, is epinephrine, it's arrhythmogenic, it increases myocardial oxygen demand, decreases subendocardial perfusion, causes pulmonary edema. Really, in this situation of bupivacaine-induced cardiac arrest, high-dose epi probably makes things a lot worse. So I'm going to show you a study from last month just to confirm and tell you what to do with your epi. But um, Lou, again, looked at lipid, epi, a combination, and control studies in resuscitation. And what he found, honestly, favoring epinephrine, yes, was that you do get a good recovery of your rate pressure product as a percentage of baseline. In terms of being able to actually dose it in an appropriate way, epinephrine pr is problematic. There's no difference in the time to recovery between the lipid only and the low dose lipid treatment in this group. So that's sort of equivocal. And again, none of the hearts that had lipid only had arrhythmias, and epi in itself does not remove bupivacaine. So where we stand right now in this epinephrine picture is the ASRA guidelines are recommending that we keep our epinephrine boluses to less than one microgram per milliliter. Lipid is not a panacea. There are case reports of even after giving your infusion, watching your patient, this patient went back to the operating room, had an operation, and while he was on PACU hold, so probably almost two hours after the initial event and after the infusions, a re arrest reoccurred. Lipid may not be useful for not lipophilic agents. And we see here in Zausik's study of rats using lipid to resuscitate that metrics were only improved when lipid was used in a bupivacaine-associated arrest and really didn't help much in the mepivacaine and, surprisingly, the ropivacaine arrests. Um, when we talk about this, and I said we've been talking about rats, think about giving isolated rat hearts CPR. Pretty good, pretty easy, not too much of a challenge. This was an interesting study by Mayer, and he looked at 10 adult pigs and bupivacaine-associated cardiac arrest, did some CPR, and then randomized these larger animals to have either a lipid resuscitation or a vasopressin-epinephrine combination, and the agents were given. And in this group, only the vasopressor animals survived. And we see here that in the uh, vasopressor group, where we have a, a rate pressure product, which is conducive to survival, whereas they never got a rate pressure product back without using the vasoactive agents in this large animal model. And we had to ask why. Is it that, you know, it's much more difficult to do CPR on a rat? Are there confounding variables in all of these studies? How long do you leave your patient or your animal apneic before you begin CPR? Um, maybe vasopressin works differently in, in animals and, and human beings? Could there be a greater response in humans? So that was sitting out there as sort of a confounding variable until just last month in anesthesia and analgesia when I saw this lovely paper, Pig in a Pokes, Species Specificity in Modeling Lipid Resuscitation. And I learned something new. I learned about something called CARPA, Complement Activation Related Pseudoallergy. And basically, Dr. Weinberg and his colleague believe that Lipid causes this complement activation pseudoallergy in, in the pig model because he spoke to his colleagues that do use them. And the authors of these articles noted that in 9 out of 12 labs, there was generalized modeling and the pigs turning red, purple, and ashen after they got the lipid itself. So it might not be that the vasopressin is better. It might just be that in pigs, vas um, lipid just happens to be bad. Well, I'll get back all to this. Let's get to some practical stuff and remind you that in 2008, ASRA published their practice advisory on local anesthetic systemic toxicity. And we keep hearing this over and over again. This was in the uh, anesthesia newsletter last month or the month before, reminding us we have ultrasound. It's, again, it's not going to take away our need to know these things, to try to prevent them, and to be aware of what they look like. Use the lowest effective dose in your local anesthetics. Use fixed needle techniques. Aspirate. Use markers when available. And remember that you need to monitor your patients for potentially 30 minutes after you've had an injection. In this uh, regional anesthesia pain medicine issue, the previous one, there was an article about signs and symptoms of local anesthetic toxicity. And in 25% of the patients that were reported, um, the signs and symptoms happened 
after 10 minutes. I mean, we usually wait and leave your patient in a block bed with the monitor on and step away and turn your back. But especially in older patients, frail patients, young patients, you really need to monitor them closely. In terms of diagnostic measures, remember, you're not always going to have somebody say to you, my mouth is metallic, my ears are ringing. It can be anything along that spectrum. And your cardiac uh, findings can be anything from bradycardia to tachyarrhythmias to arrest. The symptoms may be biphasic, and vigilance needs to be maintained, especially in patients with extremities of age, with underlying cardiac, neurologic, hepatic, and metabolic diseases. And those first three cases of cardiac arrest and resuscitation with lipid, all three of those patients did have intraventricular conduction delays. So especially in your patients with those kind of disturbances, be very, very careful. What do you do? You get help. ECLS remains our first line of focus. You infuse bupivacaine at one and a half milligrams per kilogram, and then start an infusion at 25 mics per kilo per minute. And then you can redose your bolus, you can increase your infusion depending upon which. It says avoid vasopressin, which we'll talk about, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, or local anesthetics, we know that. Remember that you may need bypass anyway, and post. So this is my anesthesia machine, this is my bottle, literally, of uh, lipid. It's cheap, it doesn't need to be refrigerated, it's got a really long half-life. Just like you would never think of giving a general anesthetic without knowing where you have dantrolene for that rare event, this is much more likely to occur, and if you're using large doses of anesthetics, I would hope that you would have the same respect for lipid that you do for your dantrolene and always have it available. I even have the label on it so nobody has to think about how to use it. So I learned a long time ago from my friend Joe Neal that it takes about 17 years to get something into practice once it's seen clinically. So it took us two years after that to see treat toxic dromes, and barely four years after we first saw lipid in human beings, it became a practice advisory and also part of ACLS protocol, where we now see it in atypical cardiac arrests for the possible benefits of lipid emulsion infusion for an overdose of beta blockers, and also for local anesthetic toxicity. They remind us that, vasopress um, that vasopressin is something that we need to be watching and watch our, what our society says. So what do you have on the horizon for us? We have dissemination of our ASRA guidelines for treatment of last. We need to find a good animal model. We need to cause the same cardiac arrest with the same doses of agents and the same time that there's hypoxia before we start CPR. We need to have realistic endpoints. It's now been decided that you, it's unethical to do human studies without on the, uh, looking at last. So we're going to look to our labs to, to show us how to uh, proceed and also continue to see what we learn from our case reports. And interestingly, several labs are now presenting or developing uh, uh, pegylated particles with increased surface area that may be specific antidotes for local anesthetics. So maybe next time I'm invited to speak to you, instead of lipid, I'll be talking about anti-bupivacaine, which we'll be able to take off the chart. Thank you very much.